A cutting-edge study shows that our traditional understanding of dinosaur size may be underselling the ancient reptiles. It's no secret that one of the biggest draws to dinosaurs, and paleontology in general in terms of the public view, is how big prehistoric animals were capable of getting. Obviously, ecology, anatomy, and evolutionary relationships form the bulk of actual paleontology work, but body size is actually a crucial element to understanding all of those. So what's the use of estimating body size? You all know that it's a topic I'm highly interested in, along with many of the people who watch this channel, to the impotent rage of some. And while it's certainly interesting and cool to know how big dinosaurs were, there's got to be a practical use for this knowledge, or self-respecting, degree-holding paleontologists like the excellent Dr. Matt Dempsey wouldn't spend thousands of hours inventing new methodologies to achieve greater accuracy. In his own words, specifically regarding volumetric models of dinosaurs, modular volumetric models also facilitate the modeling and simulation of dinosaur locomotion, feeding actions, physical behavior when submerged in water, and other biological actions. Size is an incredibly important part of an animal's biology, megatheropod fanboy contests aside, and determines the overall structure of its anatomy. A one kilogram bird of prey is going to have a totally different ecological role and body plan than a 10,000 kilogram megatheropod, for example, which in turn will look entirely different from a 50 ton sauropod that eats plants. Dempsey et al.'s groundbreaking paper does an incredible job of not only summarizing the various methods we've used to estimate dinosaur size in the past, but also goes past it, taking the best qualities of previous methods and combining them. It's based on creating rigorous 3D models of the skeleton and then predicting soft tissue using isometric and allometric equations sourcing living relatives. There's a bird version and a non-avian sauropsid version for both isometric and allometric equations. If you're interested in a video diving into all the other methods paleontology has come up with over the past 200 years, check out the Paleontology Size Guide. You can pause this video and leave it open if you'd like. I'll still be here. I'm way too excited about this paper to leave. Here's a quick refresher. Stylopodial equations like humerus and femur circumference allometry predict mass based on the circumference of weight-bearing limb bones. They end up underpredicting theropods and overpredicting ornithischians. Volumetrics work around this by taking the volume displaced by a particular model, multiplying that by density, and arriving at mass. This is much more detailed and holistic, as opposed to the broad brushstrokes of stylopodial estimation, but can also be subjective in terms of how much soft tissue you put on the bones. This paper removes a significant portion of that subjectivity by using data from living relatives of dinosaurs to calculate the most likely amounts of soft tissue we should be putting on each body segment combining biomechanics, anatomy, and phylogenetic bracketing into a frankly brilliant methodology that should get Matt Dempsey an Oscar. Dempsey's team used a technique refined in previous studies, known as convex hull modeling, where you take a 3D model of a skeleton and mathematically wrap the minimum soft tissue possible around the bones. 2021 and 2023 studies improved this method, which is an automatic underestimate, by using CT scans of living birds and non-avian reptiles to predict the amount of soft tissue dinosaurs would have. The models required relatively complete skeletons to be worth analyzing, and bone positions were based on articulated fossils as well as related taxa. Levels of soft tissue added to the skeletal were based on birds and living non-avian reptiles, with each group also having a direct proportional or isometric equation, and an allometric equation, or one where proportions change with body mass. Dempsey's team created preferred models that took into account evolutionary relationships and body composition for each taxon, so keep that in mind when we discuss new body mass estimates. The team also found that center of mass changes according to the clade studied and body size, with the center of mass moving closer and closer to the hip as the animal becomes larger. Makes sense, you'd need a high degree of stability when you weigh as much as multiple elephants. Proportions were also affected, especially in theropods. While torsos proportionally remained similar, theropod arms were found to be much smaller proportionally in the biggest species. That doesn't really come as a surprise, but it's nice to have more data on the subject. The size of the tail also varies wildly between taxa. It's only 9% of Archaeopteryx's body mass, but nearly a third of Acrocanthosaurus's. Necks went wild in the paper. Dempsey's team is quick to point out that the non-avian sauropsid values for sauropods are objectively too high since it results in a center of mass further anterior of the shoulders that would cause the animal to immediately fall on its face. 
but even the bird-based isometric soft tissue outlines are greater than how we've traditionally reconstructed sauropods. The allometric model seems to be less useful overall, given the wider margin of error and how it predicts soft tissue volumes for sauropods that would result in essentially being mummified. Now, I promised you that the paper changed our understanding of dinosaurian mass estimates. That's chiefly based on how traditional reconstructions appear to have underestimated the soft tissue that would have been present in life. As the paper itself states, many instances of previous models being lighter than or close to the lower end of our estimates are likely due to their reconstructed soft tissue outlines adhering very tightly to skeletal landmarks, particularly around the torso, hips, and neck. In many extant seropsids, these regions support thick layers of muscle, fat, and integument, which are at least partly accounted for in our models by the Macaulay et al. 2023 expansions. In other words, in our effort to remain conservative, we've gone a little too far. Certain clades are more underestimated than others in particular. One example, based on conversations with Dr. Eric Snively, is how we typically reconstruct Tyrannosaurus without as much muscle as it would have had in the neck region. The apparent disparity between stylopodial allometry, or the circumference of limb bones relative to body mass, and volumetrics varies between clades, especially in megatheropods. Tyrannosaurus, for example, has proportionally thick leg bones, and so allometry doesn't brutally underestimate it as badly as it does Carcordontosaurus. Dr. Dempsey raises this point in regards to Acrocanthosaurus, which his rigorous models calculate as weighing several tons heavier than stylopodial allometry would predict. He postulates that it's due to posture. Acrocanthosaurus was clearly much more massive than we thought when we put realistic amounts of soft tissue on it, but it needed to carry all that weight somehow if its femur was thinner than a comparably sized tyrannosaur. It would have stood with a more erect posture, holding its legs closer to a columnar position in order to ease the stress on its weight-bearing femur while tyrannosaurs could afford to bend their stronger legs more. Dempsey notes that this hasn't been biomechanically tested, but that the posture likely would have reduced the bending load across the femoral shaft. Man, this is so cool. I love paleontology. I know you're foaming at the mouth for new mass estimates, so here we go. When I spoke with Dempsey about which mass estimation workflow he considered more realistic, he said the preferred isometric, so we'll go with those. They combine the most anatomically realistic portions of both bird and non-avian reptile scaling. I won't go over all 52 taxa highlighted since you can just go read the paper's supplementary information for that, but here are a few of the more popular dinosaurs with the new masses compared to mammal-based 21% adjusted convex hull estimates from the paper. Dilophosaurus. This iconic, not frilled, not venomous theropod went from 388 kilograms with this particular specimen to 494 kilograms, a 27% increase. Sucomimus. I tragically left this animal off of the most recent megatheropod list, which was definitely a mistake. Simple convex hull models predicted 3,866 kilograms for this specimen, while a corrected soft tissue version indicates 5,260 kilograms. Synraptor. Synraptor is way bigger than I thought, at 1717 kilograms, the outdated method, and 2676 kilograms using corrected soft tissue isometry. That's really awesome! Good job, Metriacanthosaurid fans, your patience paid off. We can't leave out Allosaurus gematsoni. Big Al 2 was estimated at 813 kilograms by convex hull, and is now thought to be 1,282 kilograms. Acrocanthosaurus is the star of the show here. This specimen was laser scanned and estimated in 2009 to weigh an average of 6,297 kilograms, with convex hull predicting 5,794 kilograms but is up to 7,493 kilograms for the sail-backed model, as typically reconstructed, and 8,364 for the hump-backed model, once you factor in realistic soft tissue. That's enormous. Adding up to two tons to one of my favorite theropods is wild. Dempsey emphasized the importance of scanning 3D skeletons to estimate mass properties, so we may have been reconstructing Acrocanthosaurus in particular as too light, with too shallow of a torso and too small of a tail. He does go out of his way to let us know he's not knocking on 2D skeletal artists, who work incredibly hard with the information they're given. But we need to remember that using paper measurements and scale bars alone inevitably propagates error simply due to the limitations of the medium. Looking at bones in 3D lets you check reference points and correct for perspective, as well as see things that may not have been described in published detail. Gorgosaurus also got a terrifying bulk up, with a digital sculpt created specifically for this new study up from 2,969 kilograms to 3,886 kilograms is nothing to sneeze at, getting a third heavier. 
An iconic Tyrannosaurus Rex specimen, Amen H5027, joins the party. This is one of the smallest potentially adult Rexes, although its adulthood isn't verified by histology. Convex hull calculates 5,663 kilograms, with the new method at 7,926 kilograms. A 3D model not affiliated with the paper got 7,219 kilograms, which would mean a fairly small mass increase of 9.8%. It's crazy that the biggest acro specimen is now the same size as a plausibly adult, if admittedly small, T-Rex. Apatosaurus was previously estimated at 26 tons. That went up to 40.4 tons, showing the insane degree to which we've been shrink-wrapping these animals. It also has horrifying implications for the Oklahoma giant. Diplodocus also went up from 11.5 to 17.2 tons. Barosaurus jumped from 15.8 to 26 tons at 28 meters. Is it just me, or do the new soft tissue estimates benefit sauropods way more than other dinosaurs? Camarasaurus continues that trend, 13.4 to 18.8 tons. Ooh, what about Giraffe Titan? Convex hull had it at 25 tons originally, and it's up to 34 tons. It just added two elephants to its body mass. Repetosaurus is an interesting one for those of you interested in reconstructing Fangorn, the giant Calamedusauropod associated with the Brachaeosaurus Matleia material. An adult was projected to weigh 10.4 tons and is now expected to have been 14.7 tons when fully grown. Metagotitan is the biggest animal in the new study. Even convex hull had this specimen at 46 metric tons, a monster by any reasonable standard. But with realistic soft tissue, it would weigh 67.7 tons. Of course, this comes out right after I release a Megasauropod video, making it immediately outdated. However, the Patagotitan mass here is likely too high, since it's based on scanning the mount. The mount's gaps were scaled to material larger than Argentinosaurus, which doesn't seem to be the case for the actual preserved material. Just a few more highlight taxa, I promise. This Stegosaurus specimen is nowhere near the maximum size of the genus, so keep that in mind. Even so, going from 1292 to 1676 kilograms isn't bad at all, and will be useful for scaling bigger specimens. Gastonia is near and dear to my heart, since I got to work on excavating it while I worked at the BYU Museum. This specimen is a small one and went from 417 kilograms to 490. Not much of an increase. Edmontosaurus was 3.1 tons and is now 4.6 tons. Finally, a mid-sized specimen of Triceratops went from 4.8 to 6.5 tons. Obviously, there were quite a few large dinosaur specimens that weren't included in the paper. 52 is a lot of work, after all. Argentinosaurus isn't complete enough to apply this technique to, but given the upsize its relatives received was over 90 tons or even higher, likely over 100. T-Rex really didn't change all that much, so recent GDIs of specimens like Sue and Scotty would be adjusted up 9.8% to yield 11.2 and 11.5 tons respectively. Although 3D scan data does indicate that Sue was likely larger due to underreporting of measurements. It's important to remember that individual proportions are critical in this technique, so cross-scaling between individuals is going to be iffy at best, much less between taxa. The bigger rex specimens are much more proportionally robust than AMNH 5027 and so would likely be heavier than calculated here. What does this mean for everybody's favorite big fragmentary specimens? You're welcome to go nuts trying to apply this math to Cope and Goliath in the comments or on Discord. Obviously, individual variation will mess with any results you might get, but hey. Scaling this paper's AMNH 5027 up to 12.9 meters gets right around 12 tons, which is a realistic estimate for Goliath, although admittedly on the very low end. For now, anyway, adding 9.8% to our current GDI and 3D model estimates for T-Rex might be the best way to go, until this technique is applied directly to larger specimens and their proportions are taken into account. This would up Cope's predicted mass to well over 12 tons, with Goliath plausibly exceeding 13. I'll toss a quick update for T-Rex masses up on the screen, so feel free to pause and read, with the understanding that any of these would be subject to change according to individual variation. I also wonder what impact this Acrocanthosaurus will have on big Carcrodontosaurs. A huge reason why its mass is so much higher here is because great care was taken to account for the sail, and models were made for both a sail-backed version and a hump-backed version. Fran, the specimen used, also includes material that hasn't been described. That obviously wouldn't carry over to taxa like Moraxes or Giganotosaurus, which didn't share that sailback structure, but I'm excited to see what else comes from this new technique. 3D models also tend to underestimate soft tissue, according to the paper, so that's a fun thought. 9 to 10 ton Giga holotype could potentially be back on the menu. Large dromaeosaurs may or may not be bigger, considering how Velociraptor's mass based on GTI is almost identical to this soft tissue method. 
Medium Tyrannosaurus like Tarbosaurus, Despletosaurus, and Zhushang Tyrannus should be 10 to 30% heavier, as morphological intermediates between Gorgosaurus and Tyrannosaurus. That makes me wonder about the Zhushang giant vertebra, as well as megatheropods with bizarre proportions like Dinochirus. Something else to think about is how this may affect biomechanics. More muscle and other soft tissue would have varying effects on speed, with greater locomotor muscles in the hind limbs increasing theropod running speed, for example. All that extra weight, on the other hand, may slow these animals down somewhat. Bite force is also a potential dependent variable to keep an eye on. Were there theropods as jowly as modern tegus? Were some more slimly built but still powerful like crocodile monitors? Again, each taxon should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis when it comes to this method, and ideally we'll look at individual skeletons. It isn't something where you can take, for example, the 9.8% ratio increase from Tyrannosaurus and apply it to all theropods, so remember that. I know this is a shorter video, but I read the paper as soon as it came out and couldn't wait to make this. The Orcas in Subnautica Below Zero script is almost done, and I'm working on the art while I release shorter projects in the meantime, so you'll still get it, don't worry. I also have a question for the masses. Would anyone be upset if I moved the release date of Obsidian Dawn up a couple months? Let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on this paper, especially what issues you may have picked up on that should be refined in future studies. Read it for yourself using the link in the pinned comment. I'm Davividen, and I'll see you next time.